Who could be better to talk about these issues than George? George, thanks for joining us. It's been some time uh, since I saw you. I'm very uh, happy to see you again. Let me start uh, with that. Maybe it's a slight tangent. Uh, how come the people of Kosovo are blessed for breaking away from the country they're in, while the people of the Donbass are to be damned for breaking away from the country they're in. You are a great intellectual figure. Please explain to the audience. Well, they, to answer your question, they are blessed because they have the United States and NATO in their corner. Kosovo is a particularly egregious case because not only did their separation from Serbia come about as a result of the application of extreme violence by NATO against Yugoslavia in 1999, but they had no right whatsoever to declare independence because, first of all, it wasn't even a sovereign government. Kosovo was under the jurisdiction of the United Nations. The United Nations actually was running Kosovo at the time when it declared independence in 2008. And it was in violation of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1244, which said that there are to be no uh, decisions on final status without the full uh, consultation, cooperation, and decision-making of the Security Council. But here, the, the, the parliament in Kosovo just declared independence, and immediately all of the uh, NATO countries, not all of them, incidentally, um, uh, because to this day, four NATO powers and five EU countries refuse to recognize uh, Kosovo independence. That is interesting. Now, uh, let's uh, talk about the uh, Nord Stream. I'm not going to waste time by asking you to dilate on who done it. Uh, frankly, Inspector Clouseau uh, could work out uh, who done it. But what are the implications of it, George? Well, the implications are, uh, as you pointed out, this is clearly an act of uh, terrorism. It's an indication the United States now feels that it can uh, act in this terrorist way uh, without bothering um, in any way uh, about international law, criminality, and all the rest. And of course, it's uh, yet one more indication that the Americans really couldn't care less about the Europeans. I mean, we know that they didn't, couldn't care less about the Ukrainians, that they were ready to fight this war to the last Ukrainian, but they were ready to fight this war to the impoverishment and uh, you know, to hunger of the uh, Europeans. And they've openly said, I mean, Secretary of State Blinken said, hey, this is a great opportunity for us. We're going to make some money here. Um, so, you know, the Europeans kind of have got themselves uh, into this mess. And now, you know, the, the, this is the icing on the cake. The, 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 the Americans said to them, don't even think about making any kind of peace with Russia because it ain't going to happen. You're not going to get any gas. So just even stop even thinking about uh, doing anything to resolve this problem. Now, uh, you've got to ask, George, why the European public are going so quietly into this good night. I know that not all of them are, and electoral earthquakes have happened and are to be expected. But by and large, uh, it seems that the European public is at least apathetic about marching over a cliff on the question of whether Kupiansk uh, or Lyman is in Russia or in Ukraine, places that they've never heard of. Uh, I mean, talk about the Schleswig-Holstein question. The Kupiansk uh, question must be even more obscure. How are elected politicians getting away with that? That's a very good question. I think that uh, we've lost any real sense of uh, democratic accountability. I mean, we, we just have governments that in no way are uh, accountable to their publics. I mean, like we recently had uh, Sweden and Finland uh, this governments deciding that they were going to join NATO. They didn't bother to put it to the, uh, the public, to let, you know, whether the public should have a say in the matter. They just made that decision in other words, to put themselves 
right in the uh, in harm's way, and that's it. I mean, you know, the public, you know, the people don't get any say in the matter. It's these the, these are these governments. So we've really reached a point of there really no democratic accountability at all because any politician who emerges, who in some ways is representative of the popular will, you know that he's going to be in trouble in no time at all. You know, it's like there's a there's a deep state in the United States. There's a deep state in uh, Europe as well. You know, and I think that if, for instance, Georgia Maloney, a lot of people putting a lot of faith in her, if she were to start tinkering around with NATO policy and questioning sanctions and so on, you can be absolutely sure that uh, suddenly we'll be hearing about secret payoffs, uh, secret recordings uh, in which she had engaged in some suspicious conversations, and she will be out. I mean, it's like, so it's like we know that any politician who bucks uh, the uh, powers that be. And Ursula von der Leyen said the other day, you know, we have ways of ensuring that people stay on course. And that's, uh, that's really, you know, that was a clear threat to her. We, we have instruments uh, to deal with uh, any uh, recalcitrant governments. Now, a lot of these European countries are ruritarian, uh, um, I don't know, kind of apparitions. They're not real substantial states. They have no proper army. They have no proper economy. They are in one way or another dependent on bigger uh, European powers. Uh, but some of them are not. And Germany is not. Germany is an historic uh, and extremely powerful and important uh, state. Uh, with uh, at least as good uh, a democracy as anywhere else, arguably, given its decentralized nature, uh, slightly better uh, than others. Its proportional representation system makes its elected politicians at least a little more representative than in some other countries, my own included. Uh, what is Germany thinking and doing about all of this? Would, uh, would the Germany of Angela Merkel have gone as quietly into this good night as the Germany of little soldier Schultz? I, I, I doubt it. I, would, I, I think that um, uh, she would have put up a little more resistance, but probably not that much. I mean, we know that back in 2008, when the Bush administration pushed for uh, Ukraine's membership of NATO, and Angela Merkel wasn't happy, and uh, the French president at the time, I think it was Sarkozy, they weren't happy, but they nonetheless went along with it. And uh, and we've seen this pattern over and over again when it comes to uh, Europe and when it comes to Germany, that well, they they you know they start, oh, I'm not happy about this, I'm happy, and they quibble and whine and, and so on, but eventually the United States gets its way. And it was the same with Nord Stream 2, so Schultz, uh, at first was reluctant to uh, uh, terminate uh, Nord Stream 2, but the Americans kept cajoling and cajoling, and there it was. He just simply terminated it completely against German national interests. And, you know, we've seen this over and over again, that the Europeans refused to act as sovereigns, as, as uh, the determiners of their own destiny. And so essentially the European Union has now become subordinate to NATO and NATO is of course subordinate to the United States. So, so effectively uh, European foreign policy is shaped by Washington. There's a Bulgarian election today. Any hope of anything different emerging from that? And Hungary of course seems to now be neither married nor divorced. From, uh, from the rest of the European Union and NATO. Uh, the Czech Republic had 100,000 people out twice demonstrating to unseat their government. Are there any signs uh, of uh, European public uprising, however incohate? I think there are signs. And I think from what one can gather, I mean, in, in Bulgaria, uh, some of the, the what the media call pro-Russian uh, parties 
uh, doing reasonably well. Um, and then, as you say, we have we've had these massive demonstrations uh, in the Czech Republic. We also have um, the Alternative für Deutschland um, now doing much better in the polls, particularly in the east uh, of Germany. The problem is that it's very hard for any of these uh, movements really to make a breakthrough. I mean, when it comes to the alternative for Deutschland, no political party wants to have anything to do with them. They can win 20% of the vote, 25% of the vote, they'll still be kept out of the government. Um, and again, in the same way that in Bulgaria and the Czech Republic, should any of these uh, parties, you know, criticizing sanctions um, do well in the polls, we know that a great deal of pressure is going to be applied against them. Either they're going to be excluded from government, or if they are going to be in the government, then you know, they'll be on, under enormous pressure from the, or the Ursula von der Leyen to uh, get with the program. Hungary is an, is an interesting case, and that's because Orban um, had himself been one of these selected elites. I mean, you know, if you trace his um, history, you know, back in the late 80s, you know, he was the golden boy of the uh, anti-communists. And he went to Oxford, he got money from George Soros, um, but he, he, he abandoned them, he, you know, he ditched them, which is why he generates so much antipathy. You know, he's, he was supposed to be one of the uh, selected elites, you know, who would run things uh, for NATO, and it didn't turn out that way. He turned against Soros, he turned against his patrons, and that's why they, they hate him so much. Very interesting. George, great to see you again. Look forward to Thanks. having you back more often. Thanks for joining us.